May I request everyone in the auditorium to either kindly switch off your mobile phones or keep them on silent mode for the entire duration of the lecture. Thank you. Before we commence the function today, a brief safety announcement during the event here at the Stein Auditorium. Terry is a quality, health, safety, and environment certified organization. In case of any untoward incident like fire, evacuation is required. You are required to exit from this auditorium through the fire exit gate nearest to you without any panic. There are seven exit gates from this auditorium, four on the ground floor, one exit on the stage, and two on the balcony. In the case of a fire, fire marshals will take position in the aisles and exit gates to help you to evacuate. Thank you. On behalf of the Energy and Resources Institute, I welcome you all to the 17th Darbari Seat Memorial Lecture. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Fatih Birol, Executive Director, International Energy Agency, Shiar K. Singh, Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Power, and Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Government of India. Mr. Suman Sinha, Chairman and CEO, Renew Power, Dr. Navroz Dubash, Professor, Center for Policy Research, Mr. Ashok Chavla, Chairman Terry, and Dr. Ajay Mathur, Director General Terry. This lecture, the 17th in its series, is organized by Terry every year in honor and memory of Terry's founder, Mr. Darbari Seth, a distinguished technocrat, industrialist, who made corporate history during a glorious career extending over 52 years. To commence the function, may I request our distinguished guests on the head table to kindly light the lamp on the occasion. Thank you all. May I now request Dr. Mathur to kindly welcome Honorable Minister Shiar K. Singh with the sapling from Terry Gram and a set of herbs from Supi Mukteshwar.
Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Dr. Mathur to kindly deliver the welcome address. Mr. R.K. Singh, Dr. Pati Birol, Sri Ashok Chavla, Sri Suman Sinha, Professor Navroz Dubash, my colleague, Dr. Divya Dutt, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to the 17th Darbari Seth Memorial Lecture. As was just mentioned, this lecture commemorates our founder, Mr. Darbari Seth, the legendary industrialist whose creative spirit enabled the skyrocketing growth of Tata Chemicals, Tata Coffee, and many more successful companies. And in the process, he brought to us Tata Salt, Tata Tea, and many other brand names that are a familiar part of our homes and our offices. Mr. Seat understood that the economic and environmental challenges that India would face as more and more people had access to and used adequate amount of modern energy was a huge problem which was waiting to come. Consequently, he was passionate about the growth of an indigenous renewable energy and energy efficiency industry, which could provide adequate energy supply to all, but without the import challenges without the environmental challenges. Tata Chemicals, under his leadership, rose to a prominent position in developing renewable energy and energy efficiency. And he, along with Mr. J.R.D. Sate, founded Terry as an organization to address the energy challenges faced by India and in moving us towards a future of adequate and affordable energy for all in an environmentally sound manner. We at Terry continue to be as passionate as our founder and the energy transition in India work continues to be at the heart of the activities that we carry out. We are extremely fortunate that Mr. Seth's family joins us. We warmly welcome you as we rededicate ourselves to our founder's vision. We are extremely delighted to welcome Dr. Fatih Birol to deliver the 2018 Darbari Seth Memorial Lecture on a topic which is so close to Mr. Seth's heart. Dr. Birol's leadership as the head of the International Energy Agency in the energy sector and his forceful championing of an energy future dominated by renewables, energy efficiency, and electrification is providing leadership in an otherwise turbulent era where energy price volatility is the new norm and where changing energy demand patterns have quite taken us all by surprise because we planned for energy demand patterns of yesterday. We look forward to hear his thoughts on the global energy outlook and on India's role in it. We are particularly happy and delighted that Mr. R.K. Singh, the Union Minister for Power and for New and Renewable Energy, has kindly consented to deliver the presidential address today. Mr. Singh's commitment to ensure electrical connectivity to every household in the country in the very near future is the culmination of a long delayed dream for many of us in the energy sector. Many colleagues in Terry have spoken and written for the last 20 years about the almost criminal negligence, and I'm using words which were used in a 1998 article, the almost criminal negligence in electrifying rural households. With Mr. Singh at the helm of the Ministry of Power, we are looking forward to celebrating in the near future a day when every household is either connected to the grid or is supplied electricity by renewable energy systems. Mr. Singh has provided equally strong leadership in the growth of the renewable and the energy efficiency sectors. Under his leadership, we have seen the rollout of policies and processes 
to enable us to reach 270 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2027, and a revamp of the national mission on enhanced energy efficiency so that it can help us reach the pledges, particularly that of the carbon intensity reduction that we made in our nationally determined contribution. Many of you who were here last year may recall that last year's lecturer, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, had talked of the challenge of renewable electricity and its integration into the grid. It's a debate that has gone on year long. We hope that with Dr. Navroz Dubash here and Mr. Suman Sinha here, we, who will provide comments on today's lecture, that we will also have a debate that will continue, not only for the, for the year, but beyond, and influence public policy as we go ahead. Sir, today we will also be celebrating many of our colleagues who have completed 20 years of service in Terry, and also those who have been adjudged as star performers by adding their names to a roll of honor. Mr. Singh, we shall be delighted if you give away mementos marking this recognition to our colleagues. Finally, I want to thank each one of you for coming here, for sharing this afternoon, this evening with us, and we hope that the discussions in this evening would point to a vibrant new era in energy, both for India and for the world. I, again, welcome all of you here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to a very special moment which is eagerly awaited by everyone at Terry. The felicitation of Terry colleagues who have completed 20 years of service with the organization and the announcement of the Terry Roll of Honor for the year 2017-2018. I request Dr. Birol to kindly come to the front of the head table and felicitate the colleagues who have completed 20 years of service with the organization. All right, I request, I request both Dr. Birol and the minister to please come to the head of the front table and felicitate the colleagues. Mr. Sambhat Kumar Nagarajan. Mr. C. Surindaran. Ms. Alka Singh. Mr. Shishir Chandra Patnayak. Mr. V. K. Jayakumar. Mr. Ravi Kumar. Mr. N. K. Ram. <laughs> Dr. P. K. Bhattacharya. Mr. Mahesh Chand. <laughs> and 
and Mr. Rajiv Pillai. For the Terry Roll of Honor, every year, Terry recognizes colleagues across the organization for their outstanding performance and achievements, their dedication to work, sincerity, and devotion. I request all the esteemed guests to kindly felicitate the winners of this honor. Mr. S. Vakesh. Ms. Dolly Sangle. Mr. Nishant Jain. Mr. Prahlad Kumar Tiwari. Mr. Karan Mangotra. <laughs> Mr. M. K. Binisan. Mr. Anand Upadhyay. <laughs> Mr. Jitendra Tiwari. Mr. Swapnil Shekhar. <laughs> Mr. Shivnath Singh. Mr. S. P. Sharma. <laughs> and Dr. K. Nanta Kumar. Thank you, dignitaries. We congratulate each one of you on receiving this honor. May I now request Mr. Ashok Chavla, Chairman Terry, to kindly address this teamed gathering. Honorable Minister, Shri R.K. Singh, eminent speaker for the annual day, Dr. Fatih Birol, dignitaries on the dais, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. Please allow me to add my own welcome to that of the Director General. We are honored that you have joined in large numbers to encourage Teddy in our efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, 
home to 18% of the world population, India's energy consumption has almost doubled since 2000. And the potential for further growth is enormous. I do not want to preempt the minister's remarks, but it is clear as daylight that the government is committed to becoming comfortably surplus in power and ensuring full electrification to villages and households by next year. While increase in power generating capacity is at the core, India, like other countries, is acutely conscious that cutting emissions will have to rely on increased production of renewable or clean energy. Hence, the ambitious target of 175 gigawatt renewable energy generation capacity. In pursuance, India has been rapidly ramping up investments in renewable energy. Over $42 billion, $42 billion has been invested in re renewable energy sector in the last four years. It is also worth noting that last year, the country added more power generation capacity from renewables than from conventional sources. Since Terry is at the core of India's energy matrix, our programs are designed to complement the government schemes to attain energy targets set for the country. To overcome the problem of erratic grid sub power supply and create a market for clean energy access at the bottom of the pyramid, we have set up the Terry Jivika program. Thus far, we have lit up 50,000 households in Bihar and provided clean cooking technology through self-help groups. In June this year, Terry and the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change entered into a memorandum of understanding to set up a resource efficiency cell in the ministry, going beyond merely energy efficiency. Through coordinated thinking among concerned ministries, the cell aims to provide a platform to mainstream resource efficiency in the public policy architecture. It will also ensure a systems thinking based on materials, products, and processes. Hazardous air quality in the Delhi NCR region has been a sensitive issue in recent times. Terry and the ARAI, commissioned by the Ministry of Heavy Industries and Public Enterprises, conducted a study to assess present air quality, project future sectoral emissions, and test interventions which can help reduce pollution in the region. Conducted using receptor and dispersion modeling, the study also suggests desirable solutions to reduce pollutants and emissions. Taking cognizance of the importance of public-private partnerships, we have collaborated with Mahindra Life Space Developers to set up the Mahindra Terry Center of Excellence, a first-of-its-kind research facility it will work towards energy efficiency in the real estate industry by innovative solutions which can be adapted to Indian climatic conditions and are accessible to vast majority. Ladies and gentlemen, India's energy sector is going through exponential growth. It is also going through a substantial transition. The shift towards renewable energy presents a great opportunity to move over time to a low carbon economy. We at Terry are privileged to be part of this journey. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now request the Honorable Minister Shiarke Ke Singh to kindly deliver the presidential address. Mr. Ashok Chawla, the Chairman Terry, Mr. Fateh Birol, the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, 
Mr. Ajay Mathur, the Director General, Mr. Davroz Divas, Ms. Divya Jat, Sumant, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I am normally chary of accepting invitations for various occasions because I feel that there is a huge amount of work to be done. And when you accept an invitation to any uh, sort of ceremony or function, you sort of you know, divert time from the, the time you should be attending to your work. But this was one invitation which I accepted. And I ac this was one invitation which I accepted gladly. One reason, of course, was that uh, this invitation. So most people will tell you that I generally avoid interest. The one reason was that this was from Terry. The other reason was that uh, my friend and colleague, Mr. Fethoye Birol, was coming to talk. And the topic was something which I felt was really important, something uh, on which I want to share my ideas and my outlook with you, with the world at large. But to begin with, I think I need to first of all start by acknowledging the seminal contribution of the late Mr. Darbari Seth, who founded Teddy. It was one of the institutions which he gave to India and the world, and a very, very good and important institution, an institution which has a major role to play, which I believe needs to play a larger role in the formulation of policy. Therefore, I would encourage Mr. Mathur to interact more closely with the ministry in the policy formulation, because that's what there is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a think tank on policy. Now, uh, the person they chose for the Darwadi Seth Memorial Address is a renowned expert in energy matters. He virtually runs the International Energy Agency. I say virtually, I thought that he ran the International Energy Agency, but actually I found out that he did not really run it. He, he also has limitations because, I mean, he would really love India to be, and Ch India and China, uh, to be voting members of the IEA. He has not managed to get that done as yet. But I believe that uh, because he has not managed to do that as yet, the IEA is the poorer for it. Because let me tell you this, if you are talking about the global energy outlook and uh, you're not talking about India and China, then you are missing out 50%, 50, more than 50% of the total energy stock, both latent and uh, what is already existed. So I, I think any organization, any international organization which does not have India, as a voting member, I think, is a poor for it. But that's something which I have told Fateh over and over again, and Fateh agrees with this. Now, I'll tell you why I hold the views I do. And I think everybody agrees with it. Uh, when I told the IEA, I, was, I went to the last meeting of the IEA, and I told them that, look, our established energy generation capacity is uh, 345,000 megawatts. But that was something. That's more than most of the IEA combined. Uh, our, we have the largest transmission system, single, uh, if you're talking about a single transmission system in the world, we have the largest single transmission system in the world. Uh, that's about uh, 390,000 circuit kilometers, and I'm only talking about major transmission systems, that is interstate transmission systems. I'm not including the intrastate. That means the transmission systems within the state. Include that, I think it's, I mean, for about four times that. And it is one grid. It is one grid. Uh, operates at one frequency. It has one controller. In fact, I spent the morning there with that controller. So it's the largest single network in the world. And uh, uh, we uh, can transfer power, you know, to up to 75,000 megawatts from any corner of the country to any other corner of the country. You can generate that in one 
part of the country and transfer it to another part of the country. We are probably the third, I think the last I remembered, we were the third largest producer of energy. Last year we produced about 1200 billion units. So as I said, I mean, <laughs> if you talk about the global energy outlook and don't take into account India, it does not happen. So India has a major role to play if you talk about global energy outlook and we are playing that role. We are changing the whole paradigm and we are changing it with forethought. You know, this is not uh, I mean, the only what it is now, it is what we are going to be. Imagine currently our consumption is just one third of the world average. Uh, if you take it uh, in kilowatt hour terms of electricity, our consumption is about 1200 kilowatt hours and the world average would be about 3900 approximately. If you talk about uh, consumption in terms of uh, uh, tons of oil equivalent, our per capita consumption in terms of oil equivalent would be about 0 0.6, 0 0.6 per year per capita. The advanced countries per capita consumption is guess what, 2.5, 4 times ours. And we, so we will have to grow, we have to grow and we will grow. Imagine when our capacity grows three times or four times as it is going to grow. And we are already, we have already started. In just four years, we have added 100,000 megawatts, 100,000 megawatts in four years of generation capacity. We have added 99.9 thousand, that means about 100,000 circuit kilometers of interstate, that means interstate grid in four years. For the, while I have been here, I have been here for about a year. We have been growing at about, the demand has been growing at about 6.5 percent. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, the, this is going to grow faster, much faster. We had, our peak demand had never, uh, you know, uh, always hovered around one 58, 160, now it is already 170 megawatts and it is growing. The coal supplies to my power plants has increased by 14 percent and yet on any given day <laughs> I am worried about more, I am worried about the availability of coal. I have about, on any given day I have about 57, 60 plants which have less than 6 days stock. So our demand is galloping. The representatives from IMA met me. These are the manufacturers association about day before yesterday. And uh, their growth has been a whopping 12 and a half percent last year in uh, electrical equipment, 12 and a half percent. So 345 gigawatts or 345,000 megawatts, I mean, is just the starting point. <laughs> we are going to double it, triple it in very short order. We are adding 36 million new consumers, 36 million new consumers. Now that's bigger than many countries, I mean all, almost all the countries of Europe, etc., Australia put together. We are adding that and we aim to add that many consumers by December this year. If we succeed and I'm quite confident that we'll succeed. That's the biggest electrification program ever in the history of the world. We have already connected all villages. Now we are going to hamlets and to houses. So our demand is going to gallop. And our economy has been growing at about 7.5 percent, it will grow faster. So what happens in the world, coming back to today's, to today's topic, will be determined to a large extent by what happens in India. So we have got to grow, we have to grow, we have to grow because we want a better future for our people, isn't it? And we are determined to do that. Now energy consumption is an index of growth, so our energy consumption is bound to grow. But at the same time we took a pledge, that is how you know our government works, we took a pledge. We said that by 2030, 
40 percent of our established generation capacity will come from renewable sources, clean sources of energy. That was a huge pledge which we made, huge pledge, imagine. But we are already well on our way there. We also said that by 2030, we will re reduce the energy, uh, we will reduce the emissions intensity of our economy by what 33 percent. Both, I mean, huge promises. As you know, in the interim, we decided that we'll add 175,000 megawatts of renewable. And we are well on our way there. Uh, we've already established 71,000 megawatts. Under establishment is about 17.5 uh, uh, gigawatts, that means 70,500. And the quantity which we have bid out and which is under establishment is about 28,000 megawatts. That makes it 116,000 megawatts already. Uh, but uh, so we are not going to stop at 175. I think we'll cross that. We'll cross that by 2022. If you take it uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in terms of our target, our target is 40% of established capacity by 2030. If you take even today's status, we already have 71,000 from wind, solar, and other renewables, and 45,000 from hydro. You add that, you're already at 30.5% or 32% already. So we'll cross that target also of 40%. So we are changing the paradigm. We are uh, 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 we're taking a sort of a determined sort of move, we're making a determined move towards clean energy, renewable energy, towards a better environment, a better future for our children and grandchildren. That is something which I keep saying again and again, that we think we are thinking about the future generations, not only about increasing our consumption, but increasing it such a way that we leave behind a healthier planet for our great grandchildren to follow. That's what we are doing. And, uh, you know, the, we are also going to in, uh, encourage disruptive technologies. So we are going to add storage. Future bids will include bids for storage. We are going to come out with a storage policy, which will encourage storage manufacturing in India. We are going to change our consumption patterns to make uh, for example, mobility, electrical, so that we reduce our, for, uh, further, we re further reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We are going to switch over to clean cooking, that means electrical cooking. That is another policy we are coming out with. So our dependence on fossil fuels will reduce radically. So the demand for oil, I mean, much, uh, most of the IEA has oil producing countries, etc their demand is going to go down. I told them that when I went there, that give me 10 years and whatever fossil fuel is below the earth will remain below the earth. <laughs> That's the future I see for the world. And that is what is necessary for the world. That's necessary for us as a country. That's necessary for our future generations. But I believe that that is necessary for the world and you let storage come. Already renewable energy beats energy from fossil fuels in pricing. It's uh, cheaper, much cheaper than energy from fossil fuels. It's cleaner. You have storage, then whatever fossil fuel is underground will remain underground. And that I think will be better for mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your very informative address. May I now invite Dr. Birol to kindly deliver the 17th Darbari State Memorial Lecture on the theme, The Global Energy Outlook and the Increasing Role of India.
Honorable Minister, uh, Mr. Chairman, Director General Ajay Mato, distinguished panelists, Excellencies, dear colleagues, a very good afternoon to all of you. It's a great honor for me, for the International Energy Agency, to give the memorial lecture for uh, Darbury Said for the 17th time in this very distinguished institution, Terry. Mr. Said, as the previous speakers uh, mentioned, was a historical industrial leader, but at the same time, a visionary founding this very important institution of Terry. Terry is an institution which is, I am sure, many of you know, very important for India, but I can tell you that internationally, plays a very important role as well. My dear colleague Ajay Mato brings Terry, I can assure you, from strength to strength. I have witnessed Ajay's presence in several international summits, fora, Paris, Washington, Davos, Tokyo, China, and I can tell you that he is an excellent ambassador of Indian energy sector. And I thank you very much, Ajay, for that. <laughs> As for the International Energy Agency, ladies and gentlemen, we are known as the D Global Energy Authority and as many institutions, we are also reforming ourselves, modernizing ourselves. We are looking at all the fuels, oil, gas, coal, electricity, renewables, energy efficiency, but also climate change and investments. And in the year 2015, we made a major change in the IES structure. Namely, we opened the doors of the IEA to emerging world. For the very reasons that Mr. Minister perfectly highlighted. And in addition to our 30 member countries, in the last three years, seven, limited to seven, major emerging countries joined the IEA as associate members and became the members of the IEA family. China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and others. Mexico also joined last year. It was the, one of the happiest moments of my professional career when I, in the year 2017, last year, March, signed the associate membership agreement in Delhi together with Minister Goyal and Minister Pradhan. <laughs> and since then, we work very closely with Indian government. One of the milestones of our cooperation was Mr. Singh's very impressive speech last November during our ministerial meeting in Paris. All the key ministers of the world, all the key CEOs of the world, and Mr. Singh gave an excellent speech highlighting the impressive achievements of uh, India. So Mr. Singh, thank you very much, sir. I understand and appreciate more the value of your visit, as you mentioned today, you rarely accept the invitations, sir. Thank you very much for that. I will not go into details, but with Indian government, we work on many different levels. For example, as we speak now, several of my colleagues 
working with the colleagues from Ministry of Petroleum on the oil stocks and emergency for the rainy days in the oil markets. The world is becoming a dangerous place. So we have to sh make sure that our oil, our uh, energy is stored for the rainy days uh, uh, we may have, and we are working with the Indian government to make sure that we exchange information. Mr. Singh gave a lot of important data. In fact, without data, you cannot measure anything. So therefore, for IEA, we are known to be the data organization. We are now working with NITI IOC and 16 different data agencies in India to harmonize the Indian data system and to make it compatible with the rest of the world. We work on the power markets. India has tremendous, I will tell you in a minute, potential to make more use of solar and wind. But how to integrate them to the electricity system is a challenge. Because as we know, they are intermittent energy sources. So we are working with the NITI IOC, with Power Ministry. What are the best examples in the world again to share experiences to work on these issues, energy efficiency and the others uh, follow. And we are, as uh, uh, you will see, very keen to go beyond the current cooperation and work we have with India and go even beyond the current uh, situation together with uh, Mr. Singh and other ministries. Now from this, let me tell you a few things from a strategic point of view, how we see the major trends and challenges in the global energy markets and the increasing, ever increasing role of India in that perspective. So when we look at it in the future, ladies and gentlemen, we see a major change, but four of them are transformational. The first one is the India is moving to the center stage of global energy affairs, full stop. Very strong, growth is very strong. And at the same time, another important dimension coming from China, China is changing its energy policies moving to the clean energy sphere under the motto, as summarized by President Xi in the last Communist Party Congress, making the skies of China blue again, clean energy push. These are two important demand centers and two important moves. Second, United States, thanks to shale revolution, becoming the leader of oil and gas production globally for many years to come, as IEA has envisaged in the year 2009, almost 10 years ago. Oil production number one, gas production number one. Third, solar PV is very much on track to be the cheapest source of electricity generation in many parts of the world. Cost is coming down substantially, everywhere, <laughs> almost everywhere. And it is challenging the established electricity generation sources. And fourth and finally, our energy system, ladies and gentlemen, is being electrified the share of electricity in the total energy is increasing. Only in the last five years, the energy demand growth versus electricity demand growth makes us understand. Electricity demand increased two times faster than the entire energy demand growth. 
this is driven by different needs, by cooling, digitalization, electric cars, and others. So these are the four different, but very important, we believe, upheavals of the global energy system, which will shape the decades to come. And these changes may require, should require, for companies, governments, institutions, to give a second look to the established energy and economic policies in terms of costs, in terms of climate change, and in terms of energy security. I mentioned to you that the global energy landscape is changing. The roles of the different countries are changing. For example, the United States. This country, U.S., has been years and years a major energy importer. And U.S. energy policy, foreign policy, economic policies are based on this very fact. U.S. becoming, U.S. being a major energy importer. But now, thanks to share revolution, U.S. is becoming an exporter of energy, especially natural gas and oil. Another region, Middle East. We know Middle East as a major energy exporter, yes. But at the same time, Middle East, Middle East is becoming a major energy consumer. Economic growth, population growth, dissemination of the water needs means a lot of energy. So Middle East is not only anymore a major energy exporter, but also a major energy consumer itself. Of course, China still a major driver of global energy demand growth, but slowing down as the economy matures and also population growth slows down. And again, the India, as we have rightly in the year 2015, three years ago, anticipated becoming the leader of the global energy markets for many years to come. Very strong economic growth, modernization of the country, industrialization, and population. So these are the major drivers, and uh, I completely agree with uh, uh, Minister Singh, if you want to understand what is happening in the world, or better, what will happen in the world, you have to keep an eye on the decisions made in New Delhi, among other capitals in the world. Now, there is one issue, oil. Mr. Singh mentioned the renewables, that's very important, and I will come to that in a moment, but oil today is a key fuel source, and the price changes in oil markets affects almost everybody, especially those countries who rely on oil imports heavily. When we look at the oil markets, we see ladies and gentlemen, that the oil demand is growing and growing even faster than the historical averages. More than 1 million barrels per day and 2019 we expect about 1.5, 1.4 million barrels per day again an increase. And oil markets are going through rather difficult times. While we have a strong demand on the supply side, what is happening in Venezuela today? Big decrease, free fall of production of Venezuela. The several countries in the Middle East facing different challenges, economic, political, geopolitical challenges, their exports are 
set to decline may well mean that towards the end of this year, we may well see tightening of the global oil markets and putting pressure on the prices, unless key producers do not increase their productions. We are, as International Energy Agency, following the global oil markets developments on a momentarily basis, and we are in touch with all member governments of the IEA, all of the family members, including India. I am regularly close in touch with uh, Minister Pradhan and other colleagues uh, here, as the increase in the oil prices or any oil supply disruptions may hit the uh, global oil markets and major importers like India. Now, looking a bit longer term, electric cars. We are seeing each year record after record on electric car sales across the world, and we expect they will increase steadily as a result of declining battery costs, and many governments in the world are giving strong financial and other support to electric cars. And as a result of that, we believe we have today about 3 million electric cars, and it can go in the next two decades about close to 300 million electric cars. This is very important to see that the electric cars are going to grow and are growing very strongly for uh, the reasons I mentioned, cheaper battery costs and the government uh, support. But, I want to put a but, this record sales, for example, last year of electric cars meant still less than 1% of the total car sales, just to put the things in a con uh, context. 99% still the internal combustion engines, the, the traditional cars, one is the electric car. This is uh, very important to note and put the things in a context. Second, this growth, 100 times growth from 3 million to 300 million, does it mean this is the end of oil? Our answer is no, for the following reason. In many of our minds, we identify car oil consumption with the total oil consumption. There are two different things, ladies and gentlemen. Today, cars consume only 21% of the oil. The rest, almost 80%, is consumed by other sectors. So this is the reason, despite the electric cars penetration in the world, despite the having more efficient cars, this will definitely pull down the, uh, the oil consumption, but as a result of the growth coming from trucks, from petrochemicals, jets, despite the developments there, global oil demand will need to grow. I will give you one number. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, one third of the world oil consumption growth came from the Asian trucks only. Asian trucks alone were responsible one third of the global oil demand growth. Hence, it is great that the Indian government puts an emphasis on the efficiency measures for trucks. The message is electric cars are good, they should be pushed, supported, but they are alone, they don't, it doesn't mean it is the end of oil. There are other ways to address the, of course, in the cars, in the transportation sector, to address the reliance on oil, which is biofuels, for example, 
that the Indian government also, the Prime Minister uh, Modi in August, put an important position uh, there, making more use of uh, biofuels, again using LNG for the long haul transportation is the other way to reduce the reliance on oil. Electricity, I mentioned in the beginning. We say at the IEA, the, the future is electrifying. And here, once again, two numbers I will give you, which once again uh, confirms and justifies IEA's decision to open the door to emerging countries, India, China, Brazil, Indonesia, and others. What does it mean? In Europe, we have many diplomats from European countries here. They know uh, as much as I do. We have a long discussion still going on. Should the existing, the share of renewables in the existing fleet should be 32%, 33%, 34%, lots of discussion. Very good, uh, lots of uh, uh, debate and uh, with very good results. But, but, ladies and gentlemen, India, forget the 32% or 33% of the existing fleet, India in the next 20 years is adding one Europe. The biggest growth, one of the biggest growth in the global power markets come from India. The entire power system built in a, a European Union almost four decades will be added to Indian existing power system within the next two decades. And therefore, the choices that the India will make will be not only important for India, but for the rest of the world in terms of the technologies, in terms of cost reduction, and in terms of economies of scale. The same applies to China. In the United States, we have a, a, a discussion on the, how the power plant regulation is made. An important discussion, uh, but China, again, in the next 20 years, is adding one United States. So India adds one Europe, China adds one United States. This is perhaps the very reason why we are modernizing the IEA, why we are opening the doors of the IEA to China, India, why they are now the part of the IEA family. We work very closely uh, together. When we talk about the power sector, energy sector, one key issue here is investment. India, with its strong economy, with the predictability of the macroeconomic policies and energy policies becoming one of the key destinations of energy investments. Last year, for example, India received 80 billion US dollars for the entire energy sector. Good number, but we believe not enough. And when we look at those investments, we see increasing share of, as Mr. Minister mentioned, renewable investments. Solar PV and onshore wind were front runners. But another rising star of the investments make me happy as well, which is the investments in the grids. This is the backbone of our energy systems. And I am thankful to uh, Minister Singh putting emphasis on the grids and their critical importance of the Indian energy sector. Moving from the energy issues to one critical topic, which I know my dear friend Ajay highlights in all of his speeches and interventions. This is the climate change. So we at the IEA follow the emissions year by year, ladies and gentlemen, country by country, sector by sector. And what we have seen is that global emissions increase each year, 
each year they increase unless there is a global financial crisis, as it was the case in the year 2009. Very desperate situation. However, what we have seen in the years 14, 15, 16, global emissions suddenly, there was a plateau, no increase. Even though global economy increased significantly, about 3%, to which India made a very significant contribution, that economic growth. So we were happy and we were hoping that this trend would continue, at least flat. In fact, we need to bring them down, not flat. But at least flat was a good news. But our numbers show that 2017, they started to increase again. And when I look at the first six months of 2018, it will be only a good surprise if we don't see emissions increase one more year. So this is the number that we are uh, uh, reading. And India, of course, which it is growing economy, growing population, and growing energy sector is one of the countries which is increasing its emissions in the global energy landscape. However, it is very important to see that on a per capita basis, India's emissions, CO2 emissions today, are significantly lower than many other countries, even that of world. And despite this strong growth, we are expecting that still India emissions 2040 will be lower than the global average, despite the strong economic growth, population growth, and also the, uh, uh, the very fact that the increasing share of renewables will play an important role, and hopefully with the improving energy efficiency. And I should also mention that the nuclear is one of the issues that we need to take into account here. Now, in the international forum, when you go to meetings, Unfortunately, unfortunately, when you talk about the environment and energy, the only topic come to people's mind is climate change. And this is a very important topic, primary topic, climate change. No question. But there is another energy-related environment problem, I believe, needs to be heard and needs to be made aware of the wider public. What is that? Air pollution in the cities, quality of air. And this is very much linked to, again, energy. We have the nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. In all three of them are very hazardous for the health of the people, and we know we work together with World Health Organization. Each year, three million people die prematurely because of the air pollution and mainly uh, as a result of the local pollution in the cities and at the same time using uh, uh, primitive cook stoves in the villages. And this is mainly women and children. It is the reason why IEA is working with many governments to provide advice how to move from cook stores to other options and uh, such as uh, LPG. And one of the examples, inspirations we give to other countries is the very program of Ujwala in India. It is an excellent work bringing LPG more than 50 million households in India in an economic way and supporting uh, them. And 
to be honest with you, saving millions of lives. This is an extremely important work, and the use of LPG here definitely is very helpful, but this is a major issue, and today in China, we are seeing double-digit growth of natural gas. The main reason is, ladies and gentlemen, to replace coal to address the air pollution in the cities. So this is an issue that I wanted to also highlight. Electrification, electricity access. Many colleagues who know the IEA, who knows the World Energy Outlook, and uh, me personally, this is an issue which I am following since almost two decades uh, uh, throughout my professional uh, career. And when we look at the numbers, almost uh, 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 mid-1980s, there were more than two billion people who had no access to electricity. Two billion. And now this number came about one billion, halved. Why it happened? It happened mainly because of two countries taking this issue seriously. First, China, and then second, India. India brought electricity to about half a billion people since the year 2000. And the April 2018, it was a for the history of energy, a very important time because all the villages in India had access to electricity. If I may, Mr. Minister, I tell you a small uh, point. I came here, in fact, this morning around 4 o'clock from Norway. There was a major meeting in uh, the oil capital of Norway, Stavanger. 60,000 people, and I was given the privilege in front of the ministers, CEOs, several hundred people to give the opening speech. I made, I talk about the oil, gas, and when I mentioned this, electricity access, and India, April 2018, all the villages were electrified, spontaneous applause throughout the room for India. <laughs> this is a great success. This is not a success for energy. This is a success for a human being. So my great congratulations for that, uh, Mr. Minister. And I don't know who started that applause in Norway, but it was great. And it was stronger applause than when my uh, speech finished, by the way. So it was a great, great applause. And it made me very happy. Now, electricity demand is growing, we said, but growth is good. But it is important to make the electricity growth slower by taking the right measures so that we build less power plants. So therefore, we made a recent report on air conditioners, which we call one of the blind spots of energy debate, air conditioners today. And uh, like in many countries, cooling air conditioner is one of the, perhaps the most important source of electricity demand growth in India. Rightly so. When you look at the countries like US, Japan, more than 90% of the households have an air conditioner. In India and many other countries, it is about 5%. With the increasing income levels, they will need more comfort, which is air conditioners. Therefore, how we design the air conditioners, the efficiency standards, will be very important to reduce this electricity demand growth. Therefore, we build less power plants. Therefore, we build less investments. It's an area that we are working with Indian authorities very closely. When we look at the global energy uh, picture once again, 
Mr. Minister perfectly described the wind and solar. Major development. Several years ago, people said, when I say several years, five, six years ago, wind and solar is good, but they are expensive. But now it is changing. Both wind and solar prices are coming down substantially. In terms of solar, in the last three years, 14 to 17, solar prices are halved. We expect another halving in the next three years. It provides a lot of opportunity for new power plants. And I congratulate again India for the ambitious targets for putting the right renewable energy choices and pushing the right energy technologies and making it one of the cheapest sources of new electricity generation. Putting this picture together with the electricity access picture, I'll show you in a minute. The, not only the success story of electrification in India, but Indian government, in fact, Prime Minister Modi himself, by pushing forward the International Solar Alliance, is a very good step in the right direction. To share the Indian experiences, making the most use of uh, solar energy in Africa and elsewhere is a very good view, and it is the reason why IEA is working very closely with the Mr. Tripathi International Solar Alliance and uh, his colleagues to uh, provide support both for the uh, alliance itself and to find new partners and working with them. Another success story worldwide and for India. Big achievement in my uh, personal view. It is the LEDs. Only in the year 2010, one out of 100 lamps were sold was LEDs, 2010. One out of 100. And as of today now, 60 out of 100. Between 2010 and 2017, this is globally. This is a major, major change in the global electricity system. It shows how the innovation can help save electricity. In the last seven years, ladies and gentlemen, global, elect global electricity consumption increased by 70%, but the electricity consumption for lighting globally was flat because of this. More houses, more uh, lamps, more everything, but the electricity consumption was flat because of the efficiency gains because of the LEDs. And here, the, which means policies, government policies do matter. Markets are important, but the government policies do matter and gives a shape to markets. The very famous, the, uh, the Ujala program, the, this is a, a major program, provide the energy and finance support for the LEDs is very well known, and I tell this everywhere. We had the Danish colleagues uh, here, diplomats. There was a ministerial meeting in Denmark, the all the ministers, clean energy ministerial meeting. This was the slide, and I talk about the Ujala program, and the very fact that I have to update my number today, one trillion, more than one trillion LEDs are sold in India. Again, a big achievement, Mr. Minister. Congratulations. These are the achievements of India and the station, the world we are in. There's a lot of hope with the new technologies, but challenges never to be underestimated. Many of the technologies will not change the world from one day to another. Therefore, international cooperation, we believe, and learning from each other, we believe, sharing best practices, we believe, is very important. In this context, let me finish my uh, presentation by telling you that the higher oil prices, 75 today, as I mentioned, there are some challenges in the next quarters uh, to come. 
is a serious issue putting pressure on many governments and they are finding different ways in order to protect their economies, protect their uh, consumers. So therefore, the, we all need to keep an eye on the oil market developments for our economies, for uh, our energy systems. Energy investments is a critical issue for India, we believe, power sector and others. In 2015, we made the India Energy Outlook work. A few colleagues here already contributed to that study. And that study, those numbers, if you ask me personally, what are the top three challenges for uh, India? If Ms. I am going to see meet Mr. Uh, Minister, have the privilege of that after the, this meeting. If you ask me, Mr. Birol, what are the top three challenges for India? My answer is very simple, perhaps too simple. Investment, investment, and investment again. This is the challenge for India, getting more investment in energy sector, new technologies, grids, renewables, and other infrastructure needs. And with it is impeccable reputation of this macroeconomic stability, with it is democracy, with it is very strong fundamentals, there is no reason that we will see more investment pouring in India. We believe renewables and energy efficiency, both of them, are critical tools to address air pollution, climate change, and also reduce the fossil fuel imports as such, helping the energy security and the budget of the country for India. And this is very important that the, before some of the investments are uh, done, that we look in the infrastructure for many years to come, there is a growing emphasis on these fuels as well. Finally, not finally, one before the finally, I wanted to say what I started in the beginning. We are ready to support India to navigate through it is energy transition. We have the data, unbiased data, analysis. We look at the all fuels and technologies. You cannot focus only one, because they are all interrelated, and providing real world solution to India as well as other countries. And we are definitely, as I told the, uh, Mr. Singh last time, uh, I visited uh, a few months ago uh, India, New Delhi, and the other ministers and authorities. We are very happy India is one of our distinguished members of the IEA uh, family. Now, I know, and this is the final one, I know that the challenges are also huge. I talk, highlighted some of the achievements, but the challenges are huge. But in this respect, I can only quote what we can do from a great leader, Mahatma Gandhi, a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. The difference between what we do and what we are able to do would be enough to solve most of the world's problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Dr. Garol, for your very enlightening talk. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by Mr. Suman Sinha, who is the chairman and CEO of Renew Power, India's leading independent renewable power producer. He pioneered this new business model, creating value for both shareholders and electricity consumers through cost-effective 
and efficient generation of electricity from solar and wind energy. Renew Power today owns, operates, and is constructing a total of over 6,400 megawatts of solar and wind power. We are delighted to request Mr. Sinha to comment on this year's Darbari State Memorial Lecture and to share his thoughts with us. Mr. Singh, Dr. Birol, Mr. Chavla, Mr. Mathur, Namroz, Divya, friends, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I must say it's a, it's a real honor to have the opportunity of getting to the podium first after that extremely insightful uh, talk by Dr. Birol. Thank you, sir. That was really, really very interesting. I think it gave us a very good overview of all the things that are happening in the energy markets globally, and particularly how they pertain to India, the progress that India has made over the many years, and the opportunities for the country as well. Uh, let me comment on a few of the, of the points that Dr. Birol uh, had talked about. Uh, my one overarching comment is, with regard to some of the projections, is that while there are projections out to 2040 in a number of cases, just given the experience of the past and how quickly technology has been changing and transforming our beliefs about the future, I would not be very surprised if, in fact, the future does turn out to be somewhat different from what is being forecast at this point in time, simply because I think the changes that will continue to happen in the sector will continue to confound us, continue to surprise us, and continue to amaze us, and will continue to offer opportunities in various new areas of energy that we cannot at this point even anticipate. But my suspicion is that in the next 10 to 20 years, the future will turn out to be quite different from the way we can at best envision it at this point in time. And I think just a simple example in that respect is what has in fact happened to renewable energy prices over the last 12 to 18 months, where they've actually come down much, much sharper than anybody had anticipated in the past. And that in fact is now informing our decisions about how the future might unfold differently from what we might have conceived it to be uh, just a little while ago. I think the second very interesting point that Dr. Birol mentioned uh, was about the amount of growth that we are likely to see in India. And he mentioned that we might, by the year 2040, add another Europe to our, to our overall energy production basket. And the interesting fact is, when you look at, the, at these numbers, that even at that level, the production that we would have of, the, of, of total energy would really put, put us at about, on a per capita basis, of about 2,500 kilowatt hours per year, which, as Minister Singh had mentioned in his remarks, the global average today is about 3,900 kilowatt hours. So even after adding a Europe in generation terms by 2040, we will actually still be almost 40 to 50% below the global average in terms of, of electricity consumption. And to me, that is, in fact, a very interesting fact about India, that despite the immense opportunity and growth that exists, and that will surely happen, and will surely take place over the next 20, 10 to 20 years, whatever we end up doing as a country will still be short of what we actually need to do just to provide even the global average for our, global, for our citizens. And if you think about it, at 3,900, and this is a very mathematical thing, the average is actually pulled down because India is 20% of, by that time of the global population. Without India, the rest of the world is actually going to be having an average even higher. And so the delta between India and the rest of the world is still going to be quite sizable. And so the reality is that we operate in a country, we are in a country, we do business, some of us, in the country, we make policy in a country which has tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And I think that is something that we all have to be really thankful for because it does provide us many avenues to grow our businesses, to create new things, and to really build an India that can actually leapfrog in some ways, 
with the best of new technologies that are available right now. But the interesting thing is that while India does offer this fantastic opportunity, it's also a really a paradox. And the reason India is a paradox is because of a number of the challenges of doing business in India. So I'll talk a little bit about what those challenges are that we face to realize the dreams that we have, to realize the targets that Minister Singh mentioned in his address, where he talked so eloquently about the growth of renewable energy and about the fact that we should leave fossil fuel buried in the ground, and that, in fact, should be our attempt going forward. And I think, sir, that is an extremely, extremely uh, noble idea, and, uh, and I think something that we should really try to aspire to. In terms of the specific issues of the challenges that we have to deal with in trying to make sure that we are able to realize uh, the challenges that we have of creating all of this extra capacity, I think the first one that I would list out, and the first one, which is also perhaps the most important one, and also perhaps the most controversial one, really, and which Dr. Birol alluded to in his, in his last page of his presentation, is the issue of government policy. Ultimately, I think at this stage of our evolution, the kind of government policies that we have will determine whether we are actually able to exceed the targets that we are setting for ourselves or whether we actually fall short of them. And in that respect, having operated in India in the renewable sector for the last eight years, I would say that, and I treat very carefully here, <laughs> given the, given the uh, presence of, uh, of uh, our uh, policymakers, is that policy has very often uh, not been as conducive as it could have been for faster growth in the sector. And I think even today, just given the federal polity that we have, there is still continues to be a fair delta in terms of policy making between what the center is trying to achieve and what some of the states are trying to work towards. And I think that does lead to uh, some degree of confusion in the sector. It does lead to some issues which cannot be bridged in time and therefore does hold back growth as it might have uh, otherwise happened. I think one way to bridge that gap perhaps is to have more interaction between uh, people in the policy making side and people in the business side who actually have to do the hard work and make the investments. I think some sort of formal interaction in that regard would actually be very useful. The second point in terms of the challenges which again Dr. Birol alluded to, um, and he said it very, very, very well when he said that the most important thing really are investments, investments, investments. How do we attract investments into the economy, into the sector, to be able to fund all this growth that we need to really see happening? And if you look at the targets of 175 gigawatts, out of which perhaps only about 75 more has to be executed, but even looking beyond that at the targets of 2030 of four to 500 gigawatts, we will require almost $400 billion of extra capital and both debt and equity capital. Now, equity capital will not come in unless you have stability of outlook, which the government certainly is providing at this point in time. But the second thing that you require is a certain kind of return to be made, which unfortunately is not happening at this point in time. And that is something that I think we'll have to really think about. And I think when you look at some of the risks in the system, uh, I can see with my experience of talking to international investors that international investors are becoming cautious. And it's not necessarily to do with India. It is to do with issues around what is happening in geopolitics around the world. And it is happening with respect to interest rates, generally speaking, going up. But all of that is feeding into the issue of less interest from capital providers to come into sectors uh, where we need them to come into. So I think really in incentivizing capital to come in, I think, is another very important aspect. The third point that I would mention uh, in the area of challenges is the issue of the distribution sector, which we all know really is the weak point in India's entire power value chain. And unless that area is addressed, we will continue to have the problems of that part of the value chain spreading into other parts of the value chain. 
And when you look at the, the receivables or the, or the payments that discounts right now owe to private sector companies, it's of the order of billions of dollars. And that is something that just cannot continue because you cannot have a situation where when bank funding to discounts is drying up, that they get their financing from the private sector because that just increases the burden on the private sector companies in the, in the space. So I think that is something that really does need to be addressed with, with great urgency because that ultimately is the linchpin of growth in the entire sector. And if that fundamental building block is not addressed, then all of the edifice that we need to build on top of that will be at risk. The other thing I think I would like to say uh, in, um, in conclusion is that grid management is another very important factor. And uh, we all know that storage, and both Minister Singh and Dr. Birol talked about that. Uh, storage is an important opportunity. Uh, it's really very heartening to see that the government is talking about introducing storage-based uh, projects now going forward in the bids that happen. I think that is very, very critical in making sure that we have stability to absorb all of this new renewable energy that is going to be coming into the grid without having instability in the system. But we also, at the same time, need to really make our grid management a lot more sophisticated in terms of development of ancillary markets, in terms of uh, the ability to manage uh, the injection of a lot of solar, for example, in the middle of the day, or wind when the high wind season happens around the monsoons, and demand backs off at the same time. So there are quite a few grid management issues that we really have to look at. Because again, um, as Minister Singh said, we have the largest uh, grid in the world, but it has to really be managed in a much more sophisticated way to really become uh, the basis where we can actually inject so much more renewables into the system. I'll stop there, um, but uh, the last point I would like to make uh, which Dr. Birol again did touch upon, is the issue of climate change. Today, just to give you a very, very simple number, the accepted number that we can inject into the atmosphere of carbon, in terms of carbon, uh, before we cross two degrees centigrade uh, temperature increase, uh, is about 800 gigatons. Today, we're already at 550 gigatons. And we are injecting almost 10 gigatons of carbon every year into the atmosphere which means that we have exactly 25 years after which we cross this, the total budget that we have of 800 gigatons. India today does about a gigaton every year. Now, if we are to grow, and we need to grow, and if we grow to three times or four times in terms of energy consumption, and this one gigaton grows to two or three times, then in fact, we'll obviously get to this, uh, exceed the, the two degrees centigrade number faster. So I think the point really being just to highlight that the, that the decisions that India makes now uh, on our energy policies are going to be really, really fundamental in, in, in determining whether we in fact exceed uh, the climate change targets or whether we in fact stay within those numbers. And so I'm delighted that we have a government which is extremely sensitive to this topic. And I think that the, the comments that Minister Singh made about uh, keeping fossil fuels where they are, I think it's extremely heartening to hear. And I, I do believe that we have the ability of meeting the targets that we have and in doing so in a sustainable and environmentally friendly manner. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your very insightful comments. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also joined by Dr. Navroz Zubash, professor at the Center of Policy Research and an energy and climate expert. Dr. Dubash has been a leading voice in the Indian and global debates on energy transition and has been an early proponent of electricity sector reform. His work and analysis here have and continue to influence thought on climate and electricity issues. We are delighted to invite Professor Dubash to comment on this year's lecture and share his insightful thoughts on this with us. Honorable Minister Singh, <coughs> Dr. Birol, Mr. Chavla, Dr. Mathur, uh, Mr. Suman Sinai, and I, my, my uh, good colleague uh, from Terry, uh, thank you very much for, in for inviting me to comment on uh, Dr. Birol's lecture, which I enjoyed very much. I think he started his lecture with a very 
definitive statement. India is moving to the center, center stage. And I think that's true. His numbers, which were embedded in a panoramic view of, uh, of global energy, bear that out. So then what does it look like from the center of the stage? What does it look like sitting in India, uh, looking at India's energy patterns? Uh, I think having got this panoramic view, what I would like to do is maybe reflect a little bit on what it means for India's future uh, from the perspective of somebody who's trying to engage in these debates, uh, as are many of us uh, uh, in this room. Um, I think first we recognize, as the minister did in his comments, that the fact that India has moved to the center, center of the stage is something to deeply celebrate. It means that there's more energy for India's livelihood. Uh, it means that there's greater opportunities for jobs. Uh, it means that there's greater opportunities to energy services. But it also means that we have to think carefully about how we balance this additional energy with the, the imperatives of dealing with air pollution, energy security, and all the other sort of obligations that come with this. And I think this was very apparent uh, in Minister Singh's comments as well. So there's a balance uh, between these two things. And in order to achieve that balance, uh, I think I'm gonna pick up on three themes uh, from Dr. Birol's talk. Uh, three of them uh, that, that really uh, he talked about that I would like to take further from the perspective of somebody uh, working on India specifically. The first theme is taking further the discussion that Dr. Birol mentioned about changes on the demand side. And we've talked quite a lot about supply side changes. I want to bring the demand side back uh, to, the, to, to the middle of the, of the page. The second is uh, picking up on something that Mr. Sinha said, really about India's energy as part of India's broader political economy. I think we can't ignore that. Uh, and the third theme is to locate India in the global climate discussion. So I'll take maybe a couple of minutes on each of these themes. Uh, I think it's appropriate to start with the demand side, not least because uh, among our hosts today is, is Dr. Mathul, who really has shaped this discussion in India over the last decade, and I think it's important to really recognize his, his seminal role uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Indian energy debates, particularly on, on, on the demand side. Uh, Dr. Birol talked about the enormous progress we've made on the LED side of things, and he also talked about the enormous scope for increased demand, uh, particularly when it comes to cooling uh, and air conditioners. And I think both of these are very salient points, but I think we could dig a little bit deeper into the demand side. It's worth recognizing that India is poised, really, at the point of having a huge opportunity which we can either take or we can just leave. And that opportunity is to lock into high energy efficiency infrastructure or to lock out those opportunities, and in fact, to lock into <coughs> quite, um, profligate energy infrastructure. So let's take a few examples. One example is just the pattern of urbanization that India is going to go through. By some estimates, India will have 400 million new urban dwellers by 2050. What kind of houses will they live in? What will their, how will their cooling needs be met? What will those cities look like and what are the patterns of transit uh, uh, needs that they will have? These are all things that we really can shape in the next decade or so, maybe as, as sooner than that in many cases. So for example, we're planning to build 20 million new uh, low-income housing units by 2022. The building envelope, the way in which those are designed will determine our lighting needs, our cooling needs, heating needs in some, in some geographies uh, for the next 40 or 50 years at least. In another example, we're talking about more energy efficient trucks. That's of course a good thing. But similarly, we should be talking about whether we build us our transport networks around rail or road. Rail is typically much more efficient, and uh, that is a lock-in for, uh, for uh, again, uh, for decades. So I think there is a, we talk a lot about the supply side transition in India, as we should, but I think we should equally pay a lot of attention to the demand side, definitely focused on appliances, but also looking beyond appliances to the lock-in to some of the hardware. And those are decisions that the, the public sector uh, uh, will play a particularly important role in, uh, particularly in areas such as, such as urbanization. I also want to make the point that the literature suggests that when you focus on the demand side, it has a couple of additional advantages. Because the innovation cycle is much faster on the demand side, you can actually innovate much more swiftly than you can often on the supply side. And the evidence also suggests that the demand side brings, often brings many more co-benefits. So for example, if you have a sustainable transport network, you also bring more livable cities, uh, to give you an example of, of, of one of those things. At the same time, focusing on the demand side is, is harder to do because you have disparate 
uh, uh, bodies, you have different scales, you have uh, municipalities involved, uh, and, and so on. But I think this is something that we have to recover in our discussions here. Uh, and it, it, it picks up on a theme uh, that Dr. Birol mentioned, that these changes are not just on the supply side, but on the demand side. But I think India, where it is placed in global context, has to particularly pay attention to this. So for example, we are lagging China by 10 or 20 years in some of these hardware lock-ins. We have a huge opportunity uh, to, to, to make the right kinds of lock-ins. So that's the first theme. The second is, uh, 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 you know, sort of my, I guess, my pet area of interest, which is really thinking about the political economy uh, uh, of energy. Um, Mr. Sinha mentioned the projections uh, that the IEA and many others do, uh, um, and a lot of times the projections may not end up being quite where the analysts think they are because of various political economy factors. And I think Mr. Sinha is right to zoom in on the distribution companies. Uh, I think the future of India's electricity is very closely tied to whether or not we untangle this sort of Gordian knot of elect India's electricity distribution where we have been locked into low performing, financially underperforming, and in terms of service underperforming electricity companies, not everywhere, uh, but in, in many states. And of course, the government has taken a bold step with Uday, and this is a program that is, uh, that is still being worked out and is unfolding. Uh, it's made some um, uh, gains, but I think the problem is, is, is it would be premature to declare that problem, uh, that problem solved. As a result of uh, uh, the DISCOM situation, of course, it, we also have, it also has implications for the success, the ultimate success of electrification. Right now, DISCOMs are, are incentivized to actually minimize their service to poor customers because they lose money for every unit they provide to poor customers. Some people say that's because one should increase tariffs. Some people say that we have locked into higher cost power than we should, and it's not really just about tariff increases. Whatever that situation, that is the DISCOM issue is the reason why we actually have latent unmet demand in India. We have surplus power with a couple of hundred million people still in the dark. That is an anomaly that we have to deal with, first and foremost as a social issue, but also in terms of thinking about the, the scope for renewable energy pen penetration and so on, because it complicates the larger institutional landscape of uh, India's electricity. So I think this is something that we have to talk about, and it is the kind of, things that, the kind of thing that doesn't appear uh, when you do modeling runs and projections. Um, uh, and I think, I think we have to uh, pay a lot of attention to it. Another aspect of the political economy, uh, another way of thinking about the political economy, uh, uh, again, picking up from Mr. Birol, is this issue of air pollution. Uh, it is growing on the agenda in India, and I think it should. Um, I think all of us who live in Delhi sort of, you know, look forward to the winter with a little bit less anticipation than when we were growing up because, because those blue skies uh, are less and less uh, frequent. And of course, there are serious health effects uh, that go with it. Now, the way we're Talking about air pollution uh, is in part as an energy issue, but again, it's broader than that. It's also a behavioral issue, and it's also a political economy issue. It's a behavioral issue because the ultimate solution to air pollution is going to be, uh, at least in part, to deal with the transport sector, which given the density of India's cities, means behavioral change in the population. We are probably, well, I, I would hazard to say certainly not going to solve India's urban air pollution if we build our cities entirely around private transport. That is simply not possible. We are already an order of magnitude more dense than many other cities in the world, uh, and that density is only going to grow. So mathematically, it, it looks less and less likely. Another area where the political economy comes in is dust. In India, it's not just an energy problem. It's also because of dust both dust from outside the cities as well as dust generated and resuspended by the construction industry. Now, the construction industry is a politically challenging industry to try and regulate. So I think there are all kinds of political economy issues around many of the energy questions that I think we have to, we have to make sure uh, we untangle. I want to just take a couple of minutes to come back to climate change, which uh, I think we can no longer have conversations about energy in India or anywhere else in the world without talking about, uh, about climate change. Uh, again, it is profoundly to be celebrated that India is center stage, that India is likely to add a lot of electricity demand, but it also raises the question, what happens to the Paris Agreement aim of 
moving to a global peaking as soon as possible. And we, we saw that 2017, again, the global uh, 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 emissions have edged up. Now, when one sees that, it induces, you know, there is, there is, a, there is a round of nervousness when you see uh, 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 estimates of India's emissions going up. Um, uh, and uh, we've recently done a study where we've, a meta study of models which suggests that India's emissions will on the order of double by 2030. This is again a, a speculative projection. And certainly we have good reason for the reasons that everybody gave. The minister talked about it, Mr. Sinha talked about it. We're starting from a very low base. Even if we double by 2030, our emissions will be less than today's global per capita emissions. So now in the past, India would have been sort of nervous and defensive about this. I think some of those days are past us. I think there's a much greater understanding, as Mr. Birol's uh, comments suggested, that India needs that additional energy, uh, that we are starting with a very low base. But at the same time, we have this story about global peaking. So how do we square this circle? And I think we square this circle by India being a little bit more out there in terms of the global community, asking for two things. The first is, for India's own sake, we do need to see a global peaking of emissions. But given the mathematics of this, this also means that the countries that have peaked have to start going on a downward slope faster than they are doing. So it's easier to talk about countries that are emissions that are not yet apparent. But it is also necessary to talk about emissions that have been there for a while and whether or not those emissions can be, can be made to decline faster than we have seen. So countries that have peaked are actually plateauing instead of declining. We are seeing it in many Western countries. And I think this is something that the IEA, as, a, as, a, as an honest broker in the global debate, could very much brick up. I think, but I think it's important for India to say, we also want to see global peaking for all the reasons that, that both the minister, Mr. Sinha, and others have talked about. It is very much in India's interest for us to solve this problem. Uh, uh, and though, and, and we, we are clearly doing our part, and I think part of the solution has to be in seeing faster declines uh, in some of the countries that have uh, already peaked. So let me just uh, sort of quickly summarize what I would like to leave you with. I think that, you know, having looked at the, the landscape that, uh, that Dr. Birol has painted for us, uh, it's important in India to pay a lot of attention to the demand side and to lock in these opportunities uh, that we see for, uh, more energy, for a more energy efficient future. The second is that we're not going to deal with the social issues, the environmental issues uh, 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 in Indian energy without looking at the political economy and particularly singling out the distribution companies. And the third is to reinforce India's interest in global peaking, but located within a larger debate where countries that have achieved a higher level, level of energy use and emissions could perhaps make a little bit more effort to decline their emissions uh, a little faster than they have. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join in this conversation. Thank you, sir, for your very engaging comments. May I now request Dr. Divya Dutt, Senior Fellow and Director, Integrated Policy Analysis Program, Terry, to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege this evening to propose a vote of thanks on this important occasion in the Terry calendar, the 17th Tarbari Seth Memorial Lecture. Even for those of us who were not fortunate enough to have met Mr. Seth personally, his legacy is such that it continues to inspire. He was a great visionary who, to borrow the words of William Blake, could see the world in a grain of sand. Mr. Sait saw the need for renewable energy and sustainable consumption years before these issues entered the mainstream public discourse. As Dr. Mathur said earlier, each year on this day, we remind ourselves to show our true gratitude to our founder through our work in finding solutions to the most pressing energy and environmental challenges that face humankind. Today's occasion is made even more special due to the presence amidst us of Mr. Sait's daughter, Ms. Meena Chant, and other family members. I thank them for joining us this evening. 
On behalf of Terry, I extend my gratitude to the Honorable Minister, Shri R. K. Singh, for taking the time out to grace this occasion and for his insightful presidential address that gave us a ringside view of the ambitious energy transition that is underway in the country. Thank you, sir. We are extremely grateful to our distinguished guest, Dr. Fati Birol, Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, for delivering an erudite and fascinating lecture this evening on the growing role of India in the fast-evolving global energy outlook. I think he clearly put into perspective that while there is much to cheer about an energy future that is centered around technological advancements, innovations, and renewable energy, there are still several sobering facts about energy access, about the markets for petroleum products, and emissions globally that remind us of the challenges that we continue to face. I also thank our lead discussant, Mr. Suman Sinha and Mr. Navroz Dubash, both eminent energy experts, for sharing their nuanced perspective on, um, among other things, issues around energy policy and energy infrastructure, um, um, and uh, as, as uh, Navroz highlighted, uh, softer issues of, um, of political economy in the energy sector in India. And this, of course, comes from their deep understanding of energy demand and energy markets as they play out in the country. So thank you very much for joining us and sharing your perspective. I would like to gratefully acknowledge the presence of all our guests in the audience who spared the time to be with us this evening, as well as our friends from the media who are covering this event. Thank you. I thank uh, Shri Ashok Chavla, Chairman Terry, for outlining some of Terry's recent initiatives earlier in the evening. May I also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Mathur for his dynamic leadership that inspires us to not just identify issues that need attention, but also to be part of the solution. <laughs> Finally, we owe a big thanks to my colleagues at Terry who have worked extremely hard, both in the foreground and background, for the success of this important event. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.